Hey yo, what's up everybody? This is the MMA Talk Show. And we're doing something special this week because, man, we probably just lived like the, the craziest weekends of our lives and like we needed to talk about it a little more uh, and recap the Samurai MMA shows and the BTC 13 shows that we we attended. We attended both. It was a, a crazy idea. I won't say that at like four or five in the morning on the the mm-hmm. night of of uh, Saturday to Sunday, I was like, "Oh shit! Why the fuck did I take this decision, man? I just want to die right now, and I'm like five hours away from home." But in the end, it was all worth it. It was an amazing weekend, and Max Carabin is here today to discuss it more because he was along for the ride. He was with me. So, what's up, my man? Hey, what's up, everyone? You good, Faber? I'm good. I'm good. I, I had the chance to sleep, yeah. which was rare this weekend. And now I feel much better. I n- still need sleep though. Like yeah. uh, yesterday, I fucking went to sleep after the podcast. We did like the podcast with Greg. It was about two hour long, so a little more. Uh, I had some stuff to do after it, but let's say I went to sleep at like 4 p.m. Woke up at 10, went to work, and was crazy tired all night long. Even though I just slept this, uh, six hours. So yeah, every time we go to Ontario, we sleep like uh, 30 minutes before we go and. Uh... It's not always a good idea. Yeah, that 30, 30 minutes is the word. Like basically, that's that's how much time I slept between Samurai and the BTC. But yeah. let's do it. Let's begin uh, with Samurai MMA. Probably the best night of my whole life, and that's because uh, I had the chance to do commentary for the first time of my life. I was the the guest analyst along with John Ramdeen, an absolute legend of the game, and. Uh, the guy who just made me feel so comfortable, like from the beginning, uh, I wasn't even stressed because he's so good at his job. He's, he's so good to, to just give me the good lead-ins and stuff. And it was just easy. And to be, I don't want to flex on people and shit, but I, I think I made it look easy. To be quite honest, I think I, I made it look easy, even though it was my first time. I, uh, I gave it my all and I think that the result was amazing. And I, I'm really proud of myself. I'm really proud of everything that you know, I like. Man, I grinded for five years for that shit, and uh, I'm just so happy that Daniel and the, the people at Samurai uh, trust in me because, you know, I'm a wild fuck. Sometimes I just come on and scream and <laughs> ruffle feathers, and, you know, I'm not the more the most PC guy, let's say, like that, and they, they still believed in me. They, they knew that I, I could have a more serious side and do the job when it was time to do the job, and, like, I'm super glad that I had the chance to prove that to, to people, basically, to prove to everybody. Yeah, I'm a fucking weirdo on the internet saying stupid shit all the time. But, like, when it's time to to be serious and do commentary for an event and, like, try to represent for the fighters. Because in the end, my job is just to, to represent for the guys, to, to, to tell what they've been doing good about their training and, like, trying to, to, to guide people through the fight by telling them more about the fighters and, uh, I really took it at art to do this, and I really hope that on the English side of thing, everybody that listened to, to it had fun and thought that I did good. Uh, that would mean a lot to me if if I did, and if I didn't, then fuck it, I'm gonna get better next time. But I'm pretty sure I did. So you did. I'm gonna need to change my camera battery because it's dying, but it's okay because you're here, Max, and uh, yeah, you're gonna tell us about your samurai experience because it wasn't like mine. Uh, but you were still cage side, some of the best seats in the house, and you were able to, to, to film some uh, awesome content for the vlog. So tell me more about the, your experience while yeah, I change sure. that shit. Well, first of all, uh, I bought the pay per view, uh, and I've been watching it nonstop since uh, since I were back from Ontario. If any of you didn't have the chance to watch the event live, it's still on Fight TV. You can buy the pay per view for only twenty US dollars, and it's three hours of good MMA fights and good MMA commentary with John Ramdeen. And my man Faber Glass. It was one hell of a night. I just uh, did a radio show in French this morning, and I was still buzzing. Smile to my uh, ear. I mean, uh, what a show we had! Uh, Pierre Tivierge put on a good show. First fight of the night. Uh, we had like about eight French Canadian fighters, and five of them won. Two losses, so we had seven French Canadian guys. It was amazing. First time MMA in Montreal since uh, two uh, two years and a half. Uh, I couldn't ask for more. I was cage side with you and Greg. We had one L of a time, and uh, I can't wait to talk about the fights. For sure, let's do it right now. Main event: Cal Prepelec, Michael Dufour. Uh, Michael Dufour only knows how to do two things. 
And that's either a first round finish by submission or an absolute fucking crazy war that goes the distance and, uh, and ends up in a split decision. Fortunately for us, we had the latter. We had the crazy ass stupid war. And that's one thing I want to say about that samurai card. It's like there were so many hurdles, so many things happening like to basically prevent this event from happening, like either from the commission side to like just the, the government side with the, the vaccine passports and all that stuff. So like everything was going in motion for this event not to happen and not only it happened, but like I've rarely seen an event that delivered in that fashion. The two main events, uh, that two title fights were like absolutely amazing. We would probably be buzzing about Mar Morgan versus Ammo if there if it wasn't for the main event, which probably was the fight of the year in the country. And before that, we're going to speak about it, but La Doulard came through and, and we <laughs> Rania Gavrilovich back in the cage and he did some absolute madness, so... Not only the event happened, but like it couldn't have happened better. The, the the main events, every fight on the card delivered, and like it went up and up and up. And at every time we were like, oh man, we like that Stranya knockout was crazy. We've seen the best of this card, and then whoa, like the, the other thing happening after was even better. Then even better, and it ended on such high note. It was amazing. But as for the fight, man, I feel like. And I don't feel, I know that Zfal is not taking this loss too well. Uh, he believed that he had done enough to, to, to win the decision. It, it's a really close decision, to be quite honest. I don't really mind for who you score it. The fifth round was razor thin, but it's one of the first time in my life that I, I have seen a fight that was basically decided in the last second. We often say that like as a saying, as an expression, but in, in that case... It was real, basically. Prepolek came out really good, was able to, to first of all, to shut down his false wrestling and shut down his guillotine attempts. 100% uh, shutting him down. There were no like good tries for his fall. He wasn't even able to secure the position that could lead to those type of attempts. So that's the first thing he done very well. And when... Uh, Dufal was kind of stuck on the feet. He was trying to rush Cal Prepolek to, to make the fight dirty. And Prepolek was able, with his slick striking, to, to counter really hard, hit him in the head, flush twice with some head kicks. And basically was winning the fight in the two first rounds. And we were saying, damn, Dufal needs to, to turn this around. But I feel like at the second that Dufal accepted that he wasn't going to be able to grapple that guy, he just said, fuck it, I'm going to go on little on the striking. And he really started putting his feet down and putting power in his punches and throwing punches and bunches, trying to trap Prepolek against the cage. And as the fight was advancing, it was really getting to Prepolek more and more. So much that Zfar clearly won round three, clearly won round four, even at some really good moments in these rounds where he was, like I said, putting uh, Prepolek's back against the cage and just trapping him there and going with flurries of punches. And Prepolek had to, to survive that tough stretch. And then the, the fifth round... Um, as I remember from the broadcast, me and John basically were given that round to fall up until the final minute where it really got super, super close because Prepolek kind of put the, put the pace up, really recognized that it was the end of the fight that, and he needed to do something special. And like I said, basically in the final second of the fight, Prepolek was able to pick Zfal up with a huge takedown and basically slam him on the ground. And he wasn't able to gain no control or anything from that, but it was an eye impact move as the bell rang. That was the freshest thing in the, the minds of the judges. And two out of three judges gave the, the, the final round to Prepolek, giving him the belt in the, like an amazing performance because the things that Prepolek needed to do to win that fight he did them. He needed to shut down the grappling. We've seen we've seen him having trouble in the UFC with takedown defense and that stuff. And we know that Prepolek, if he could just stand with somebody, he's basically going to beat everybody. So he was able to not get taken down and to have an, an amazing game plan. And like he really deserved that, that win. It was an amazing win for him. And as for Dufal, yeah, he's not really a loser. Like I know he's feeling it and he, he was so close to the UFC and so close to his first professional belt. I know it stings, but like in the end, it was an amazing fight. And I feel like he can gr he could grow to, to, to love that performance sometimes. It's sure that right now it stings him because he really wanted that belt and he really wanted to, 
to, to, to win the first Samurai main event in front of all the, the, the people that came to see him. But what you're going to do, it's not going to be this time, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to happen in the future. I feel like Prepolik showed that he should have never got cut from the UFC. And by default, the fight being so competitive, Dufal just showed that he was UFC level too. So th that's what I had to say about that. Uh, what about you? What, what are your thoughts on that main event? Yeah, you're right uh, everywhere. I mean, uh, the buzzer beater takedown from uh, Propolek won him the fight. That's for sure. It was a, a great fight. He started so well in the first and the second. Uh, he was he was piecing up Mikael on the feet. Great counter punches from uh, Propolek. Um, I was very impressed by Mikael too. I mean, I was expecting a ground fight. So him doing his thing, jujitsu or like submission threat and everything. But Propolek was so good to to take that to defense every attack from Mikael. So when, like you said, Mikael realized that it was going to be a kickboxing fight, he, he tuned up. And um, a word that you and John used a lot in the, during the broadcast, it was craziness. Mikael's craziness was go was winning him the fight until the buzzer beater take down. So it was one hell of a fight. I'm very happy for Purple Egg. There is a, he deserves it. Of course, I would have liked Mikael to win the belt, but I was very happy to see a performance like that from him. I didn't know his striking was that good from the fall. Pripolek is one hell of a striker. So, yeah, good good W for both guys in my book. Mikael is going to be back. And Daniel told you that he was working really hard to put him on a contender series fight next summer. So, good things. Only good things for Mikael. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, uh, it, it, it's cool to see that basically striking has become one of the biggest tools in Zufal's game. I'd say probably is third or fourth best tool his first one the submission game for sure i think it's fair to say that second and third best tools for his fall is chin and cardio no, chin yeah, is unbelievable the, chin the, the head kicks that he took yes yeah, yeah, nobody nobody should have survived this and he took plenty of them and yes he was wobbled at times but always stayed up always keep kept on fighting kept on defending himself it was a, at no point in the fight he was close to being finished even no. though he ate those early those, those elacious strikes but striking has really become his best tool after the chin cardio and pure uh, jiu-jitsu submission grappling but i think it's fair to say that a little bit like prepolek in his ufc run like we clearly know what Zfal has to improve and it's his wrestling he's so much of a good guy on the ground, so dangerous. If only he could have a little more wrestling to be able to take these fights down when he needed to, it would make him like by far the most dangerous fighter in that division. He's finished everybody he's won against. So he's already one of the most dangerous guy, but the only thing he needs to work on that he should focus on is his wrestling. I know he was focusing heavy on striking in his recent camps. It's really showing that the work that Nathan Roy has been doing with him, uh, it's really showing, and I feel like now, not time to abandon his striking training. Now he needs to keep on improving there too. But maybe a, include a little more wrestling in his training because that that's really in his Ronson fight and his Prebolek fight. If only he had a little more wrestling in these fights, uh, he would have absolutely have won these contests, I believe. So yeah. Uh, so for Prebolek, you know. That was the, the, the kind of knock on him coming from the UFC. He had to improve that. He improved it in this fight. And now it's time for Zufal to improve something in his game and show us next fight that he, he's taking care of, of business and that he's ready to, to, to become a new fighter and learn from this defeat because he's still so close, like we've been saying. He's UFC level. He just needs to rack up a couple wins again and he's going to be there soon, soon enough. And for Prebolek, fuck, get, get him back right now. This guy should have never left the UFC. Yeah, high caliber fight we had uh, Friday, the main event. Oh my god, both guys deserve to be in a bigger league, for sure, for Even sure. Even though I love Samurai. Yeah, no, we, I, 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 I watch Cal Prebolek and Mikhail Zfal fight each other twenty more times. I don't care, but yeah. like these guys, they need to, to move on for sure. And like, just how like, can you not? Yeah, go just ahead. like the other guy we're gonna talk about in a in a moment. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, the other guy needs to get the fuck out of here. <laughs> <laughs> probably earlier than th these people but yeah uh, as for prepolek too it's, it's just really tough not to be happy for him you know i mentioned it almost everywhere i even said it to him and to, to this coach uh, michael it's, all, it's well known he's my friend he's one of my good friends uh, in life and stuff but 
But listening to that fight, listening to everything that happened before the fight and with all the, the interactions I had with Cal Prepolik, he's been on my podcast twice now. Uh, this guy is amazing. This guy is so cool, so like calm and never says a, a word like louder than the other. He's just the real gentleman that everybody loves, that's so soft-spoken, so nice in life in general. And like we've we've got some characters in that sport. We've got some weird people and it's just refreshing to see a guy like Cal Propolic being such a gentleman, such a good person in life. And it's always cool to see these people have success. Yeah. Even learned a few, a few French, French words for us guys. So I can, can't say an, uh, enough good things from a uh, Cal Propolic. Nah, he's the man and uh, we're really happy for him. Then you were talking about it. Uh, Alex Morgan, Majed Amo. Major props to Majed Amo. Like first, first of all, because we're going to speak a lot about Alex Morgan now. Uh, that's kind of the the, the, the name of, the name of the game. But major props to Majed Amo. We knew that he was that type of fighter. I've never seen a boring fight from that guy, and it's because he's a fighter. And even though it's not going well, he still fights and he still tries. And he had some good submission attempts in that fight. He really did his all to to, to survive the, the Alex Morgan storm in this fight. And Like he couldn't he, because of the super well placed body punch in the fourth round. But Amo is a real fighter, is a guy that won the arts of many fans with his performance uh, back in Montreal. And uh, I just got to give him major props before we just go on and, and talk about how Alex Morgan is probably one of the best fighters pound for pound in the country. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, man. Uh, the, the guy is the 145 king in Quebec and Canada all over, all over the, the, the damn country. Uh, from west to east, he's the best. Alex Morgan deserves to be in a bigger league. If, he called the Dan White. He said F word Dan White. I don't know. I don't know if you get that on the broadcast. So I don't know how Dana is gonna find that. But uh, he deserves to be there for sure. Uh, what a technical uh, fighter! Uh, so good. Improved his uh, submission threat defense. We all know he got finished by Charles Jourdain with the same thing that Amo almost finished him in the first round, but he got out of that. Two submission threat got out of that, and then he controlled the fight from A to Z. Oh yeah, and his, his jab is amazing. Is is right and is like to be honest, I don't know if I saw one right hand land somewhere else than on the temple and on the chin. It was so precise, and his right hand was lightning quick. That the release on it was absolutely. Amazing for a 145er of his size. He looked like a monster in the cage. He looked way bigger than his opponent. And he was still by far the faster fighter and the, the hardest hitting fighter. And the way that he was setting everything up with his jab, like we know him to do. That's a, some classic Alex Morgan shit that we saw in that fight. But like you said, with the added wrinkle of the submission defense, to be able to get on top, land a couple of takedowns here and there, get on top and, and be careful on top, but still score some points, do some damage there. And when the fight got back up, of course, he continued his striking clinic, but really good all-around performance from Alex Morgan, who like, he just needs to leave. He can't fight here anymore. First, nobody wants to fight him. Majed Amo was probably the only fucking guy in the country that wanted him to fight him. Uh, he's been to France earlier this year. Uh, I don't think that people who saw him there are probably, they're not like lining up to fight him either. Like there's no line at the door for Alex Morgan. Nobody wants to fight this guy. So please to get him somewhere where people are going to be willing to fight him because he, he, that's another guy who deserves it. Yeah, he is a complete fighter for sure on the feet, on the ground. Wrestling's good. Uh, this guy's a top, top, top fi fighter, top player in the game. <laughs> I can't wait to see him in the bigger league. I'm sure we're going to see him. He's, he's done with the, the regional uh, fights. He's going home. He's going to the UFC. For sure. And then, La Douleur. <laughs> 50 seconds of pure insanity. Uh, Strania Gavrilovic uh, had all kind of problems, like legal problems, personal problems everything went pretty much wrong in the last few years for that guy, but he was able to, to resolve all these situations and better his life, better his legal situation. He was able to obtain his license finally after going to court against the, the commission. And it was comeback for him, comeback season. And he came in ready. He came in super prepared, super in shape. And you know that 
he's able to be a technical fighter, but the, like he say, he probably says it the best. He's such a good speaker. He, he always finds the words to, to describe thing and like mark the, 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 the minds of people with the stuff that he says. But he, he told us that like the werewolf within him, sometimes it just takes over and he can't control it. And that's what we saw in that fight because he started it and trying to, to, to get a jab out there and do some stuff. And Busuku came in swinging with the hooks and the werewolf took over and was like, oh, we're going to trade hooks. Let's see who falls first. And they traded hooks. Of course, it wasn't Stranio who fell first because he never falls. And <laughs> when the guy fell to the ground, he basically double hammer fisted him in the face, like flying Donkey Kong punch. It was absolutely <laughs> insane. And then went on to, to, to scream at every camera in his face, come scream at me and John, then scream, screamed at Pat Leno during the interview, called out Steve Bussey, told him to buy, buy himself some balls on the Wish so that they could fight, and then blasted every promoter saying that he was fighting for the money. Now he wasn't fighting for the sport anymore. And... It ended up like, to be honest, amazing co-main event, even more amazing main event. But when we traveled to BTC the day after, the only thing we were talking about is La Douleur and Stranja Gavrilovich and all the, the, the shenanigans that implied his presence. So, man, it was the surprise for the fans after all the hurdles, after all that happened. Uh, Samurai was working hard to, to put him on the card as a surprise, as a gift for the fans and and. We couldn't get a bit a better gift. Oh yeah, he told and showed everyone that in his DNA there's not only blood, there's pain, violence, and douleur. For sure, man, he's the <laughs> master of la douleur. And, and shout out know. to Bosuku, man, who came from France and got obliterated by Gavrilovich and still left the cage with a half of a smile on his face, and he was happy to be there too. It was an experience for him too. So shout out Bosuku. Yeah, for sure, man. Uh, a real warrior. Like, you gotta be a crazy motherfucker to plant your feet in front of Strania and swing yeah. hooks. And the fucking guy did it. So, we gotta give him all our praise. He's an absolute bad man. This was a, a car accident. Like, if there ever wow. is there is ever a fight that looks like a car accident, that was one. Uh, absolutely. They just crashed into each other. It was absolutely insane. <laughs> Then, uh, let's go to... I feel like... We can say there were two portions to that card. Yeah. Like the the, the yeah, main yeah. event, talent, established fighters. That was one portion. The other portion was like more prospect oriented. More. It was the the prelim and the main card. The three yeah, first fights say, were the main card and the three exactly. other ones. And let's say that the main event of the prelims was the return of Frédéric Dupro, one yeah. of Quebec's brightest prospect, an absolute killer on the ground, H2O MMA prospect and. Uh, he suffered a big, big knockout loss in his last fight. Uh, that was three, three and a half years ago, like so, uh, middle of 2018, basically. And he was able to, 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 he was not able, should I say, to fight until last night, until Friday night because of the pandemic, because he, he took time after that knockout to, 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 of course, make sure that everything is good before he steps back into the cage because he's still a young man and like you don't want to, like sacrifice your career because you came back too quick after a knockout like that. It was a really, really bad knockout, really bad knockout, but came back, uh, was able to take Patrick Connors down, was really smothering on top, had some, I won't say some problems with his guard because I think it was expected that Patrick Connors with his six foot one frame at featherweight, he, he, that's what he does on the ground. He's just like bugging you with his legs. He's got legs and that's his game. Having legs. And it's a really good jiu-jitsu game when you're on bottom just to have legs to be there. But uh, Connors was trying some missions, was doing what he had to do, not to absolutely get dominated by Dupre. And Dupre was able to capitalize on the triangle attempt to pass the guard. And from now on, he just, he just choked him with a side choke, not from the side, basically. But we all know Frédéric Dupre, legendary guillotine. And I felt it before. I felt this guillotine before. And it's really efficient because of the squeeze this guy is super strong super physical and he's able to squeeze from almost every position and he that choke even though it wasn't a guillotine really showed us like the the, the extent of, of a squeeze because like you can't really finish people with a side choke not from the side and he fucking did it Yeah, that was that looked painful a lot for for Gunners. And props to him, he, he tried to defend it. It wasn't an automatic tap. 
even though the squeeze was really hard. He tried to get out of it, couldn't, tapped, good win for Frédéric, who only had fought like a minute and 15 seconds with the three fight combined. So this fourth fight went uh, two minutes 50, almost three minutes only for this fight. So he doubled his cage time. So I'm very happy for Frédéric. We know him personally. He's a good guy. Uh, he finished Connors. He wasn't happy about Connors missing weight, even though it was not Connors' fault because uh, the weigh-in got pushed a little bit early than it was supposed to. But Frédéric came in the cage with a with a, like a uh, like a violence in his head, and he really he, he put Connors down in the first seconds of the fight. I was expecting them to exchange on the feet a little bit. It didn't happen. Frédéric took him down quite easily and um, worked his way up, and then finished the fight with a good choke. So yeah, really happy for Frédéric. Uh, Patrick Connors is uh, in the, is good too. We're gonna see him back for sure in the Samurai. But good, good win for Frédéric. We're gonna see him on the top of the cards coming in the few next events. So it is a name to to remember, Fred Dupre. Yeah, for sure. And as for the way, and like you said, I, I believe, the, but I, I don't believe. I asked, <laughs> I asked Patrick Connors, and like he just wasn't aware that the way in was at ten. Yeah. Until they told him the way ins now we're waiting for you. You got yeah. the way in now. So the guy, yeah, he missed weight, but he missed weight by 1.8 pounds and basically was on pace to make and wait 412, which was the established time of the way in before uh, the commission switched it all around basically twice because they said, okay, we're going to do the way ins at 10 and then we're going to do the medicals after. And then everybody was there on weight at 10, except for weirdly enough the english fighters like the only guys that weren't there were um <laughs> oh man i'm gonna say some stupid right now but were Ma Ma majed amo patrick connors and were noah crosswell where you at noah man <laughs> i think we heard that before where's noah where is he, where is he at i don't know <laughs> who knows i think he, 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 he wow. Let's say like that. He's probably put yeah. an end to his career by not showing up. But yeah. uh, congrats on your one or your 0-1 career, Noah. That's the way to go, my man. I don't think promoters are going to be lining up to book you now. But that that's some bullshit. But let's say like that. I think like maybe the info didn't go cro across well for the a a cross well <laughs> across well for the English fighters, and that that that's just sad for Pat Connors who had to relinquish a percentage of his purse because of basically an error in, in the way in the, like a miscommunication let's say like that in the way in procedure but the guy showed up seems really prepared wasn't probably expecting Frederic to shoot on him in the very first moment of the fight that's what he did that's why he won uh, I, I'm excited to see Connor again in the cage I'm sure he can show us way more than he did Friday yeah absolutely and uh, like you said Dupre is the type of guy to try to swing on you so you shoot then choke you he's not the guy that used to shoot that much on his opponent so yeah there was a surprise factor here even though like he was facing a grappler it was expected that Dupre was going to try to choke him out but to see Dupre being super aggressive with the takedown that was that was a new wrinkle great fight then, like from Dupre. yeah really then uh, Guillaume Fortier Maxim Poulain I expected a grapple fest out of that one uh, in the end, that's kind of what we get, but super one-sided. Uh, and I, I'm not even blaming Guillaume Forcier here, to be quite honest. We've just got a guy who haven't fought in 11 years and who's a police officer who has a family with some children and who's teaching jiu-jitsu. And like, yes, he's been able to train properly for that fight. That's not what I'm saying. But like the guy has to make more sacrifices than the normal 20-something fighter who's not really working or working a job that pretty much built around his training. And that's not the case with Guillaume Forcy. And if he's working some, some day shifts and he can only train at night and he's got no partners at night to train, that's going to be the way that it's going to be because he doesn't really have control over that stuff. You know, when you work for the police, especially in Quebec City, the second biggest city in, in the province, in the pandemic too, where you got to have more people because they need to enforce the curfew and all, all these stuff that were happening. So... Just a tough situation for him to fight Maxim Carcajou, who's a, a, an active fighter and uh, an amazing grappler, and uh, now a black belt because after his first round submission, one he received his black belt from Firas Zabi. So 
just a domination for Poulain. A tough matchup for Forcier. I'm happy to see Forcier back. He's the type of guy that really fighting for the love of the game. Now he's not trying to get to the other level. He's got so much going on in his life already, and to see now these guys now, now he's super hungry for a win. Now yeah, he... not exactly for sure. Now he wants to win. He wants to prove that like this was some bullshit and that he can yeah. do better than that. And for Poulain, if you want to move up in the in the rankings and in the mind of people, that's the way to do it. Just handle people like that in the first round. And I, I don't think there's nothing much to say about it. This guy is an amazing grappler. Don't go on the ground with Maxim Poulain because he's smothering too. He's not like the, oh, I get you on the ground and I'm everywhere spinning and shit. And now, oh, I got a submission. He's a smothering grappler. He's going to yeah. try to flatten you and land some ground and pound so that you give your neck. So... It's even though he, he beats you in two minutes, it's like a very, very bad two minutes to enter. Heavy pressure. Yep. And then an amazing way to begin this event, uh, Pierre Tivierge, Yassin Nasri. Uh, once again, we're going to speak a lot about Pierre here, but before I just want to give some props to Yassin. Uh, came in ready. Uh, well, I, I feel like it was kind of bluffing us. Like, oh, I'm a grappler, I'm a jiu-jitsu fighter, uh, I started jiu-jitsu and then I went on to MMA and like his only available fight was a, a role, basically a role in the gym with another guy. So we, we were thinking about like, oh, this guy's going to be a good grappler and just comes in with the clinch strikes, the elbows, the knees, he had amazing Muay Thai, was bouncing on his feet really well. So clearly a really, really comfortable striker. I feel like he was trying to, 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 play, to, to play the game a little bit here, but but uh, we figured him out now. He's an amazing <laughs> fighter. And now he didn't win the fight because Pierre was just amazing with his takedown and his pressure. Uh, Nasri was not accepting any positions, but Pierre just kept on grinding and just forced him to accept these positions in the end. And yeah. it started uh, as a very competitive fight and ended up pretty much as a beating because Sivier just beat the will out of that guy. Yeah, you know, it was that type of fight that Whenever Tivierge was taking Nasri down, you knew it was going to stay there for a couple of minutes. Pierre was way heavier than Samir, uh, than Yassin, who showed us great, great, great striking and good, good jujitsu defense too. Because uh, Pierre wasn't gonna going to submit him, but he won the fight with control and like a uh, pressure and good uh, ground and pound from Tivierge too. But on the feet, Nasri was outstanding. Even Greg. Loved him uh, as a fighter, so I can't wait to see Nazri again. But Pierre showed us his toughness because a lot of fighters would have given up with the first round beating that he was taking on the feet. But he stayed there. It was the very first fight of the night, the very first fight in Montreal for like two years and a half. So he probably had a lot of stress and jitters. His family is, is there. He kept uh, his calm, uh, took, the, took the shot. We saw him after the fight. He was a little bit bruised up. But he won the fight and he was really happy with his performance. Yes, for sure. Amazing performance. And like you said, the first fight since like May of 2019. And that card was in Gatineau. So we were uh, 40, 47. TKO 47 was in Montreal. So April 2019 since we had MMA in Montreal. So P.I. had like the huge task on his shoulder. Yeah. The, the kick back. The new, to kick off the new era of MMA. The, the, the samurai MMA era. And like, in Did the amazing. end, yeah, amazing event. It was like the prediction value. That's one thing I want to uh, talk about too that we didn't talk about in the beginning. Uh, there was always gonna, going to to be some comparisons here some, some, with TKO, you know, because TKO was the league in Quebec, was the best league in Canada, was like amazing to watch, amazing to look at the money that was spent into the TKO promotion. That's enormous amounts of money. So there was always going to be people trying to compare Samurai and TKO. And fortunately, Samurai just hired the same producer, the same guy that did the TKO shows. That's the guy in, in his team. That's the guy that they took. His name is Eric Pedno. He's basically a legend in Quebec. He, he was doing the Montreal Canadiens game. And like he, as a sport producer, he's one of the top dogs in the game. And he was really able to, to make this event look so good on TV, on Fight TV. As you said, you've uh, you've watched the broadcast. I've rewatched the broadcast too because I wanted to see my face. And like it, it looked good. The production value was amazing. The way that the, the venue was set up with the lighting and stuff, it really looked super professional and like 
to, to make a segue, but we're going to go to some Manscaped before we talk about BTC, mm -hmm. but just to make a segue between the two. And I don't want to knock BTC at all because it, it was a super good event too. We're going to recap it right now, but like it looked so much different. Like you can see the BTC first, it was in a bigger arena, about 3,000 capacity. And like there was never going to be much more than a thousand to fifteen hundred people in that crowd. So it was cool, but to be in the big arena with less people and a darker, let's say, not mood, but lighting and stuff. And like the way that the the, the arena floor is really high. So you need to have like super costing equipment value to be able to make the lighting uh, crazy and all that stuff so it was more somber more dark like you, you're used to see from your regional events on fight pass like i feel like what we saw from btc that's the norm what samurai did that's outside of the norm that's a super highly produced good looking broadcast that probably cost so much money to to daniel and the producers but like the feedback was amazing the fights turned out to be absolutely crazy and uh, i think we we couldn't have asked for for a better night uh, for the return of mma in quebec no definitely the greatest night of the year in in montreal for sure Yep. Let's go to some Manscaped before we talk about BTC. Support for the MMA Talk Show is brought to you by Manscaped, the champions of the world in men's below-the-waist grooming. Manscaped offers precision-engineered tools for your family jewels, and they just launched their fourth-generation trimmer, the Lawnmower 4.0. You heard that right, the 4.0. Join over 4 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with this exclusive offer for you. That's 20% off and free worldwide shipping with the code MMATalk at manscaped.com. Just imagine shaving with a sleek, well-designed, and optimized trimmer that makes shaving time your favorite time in the bathroom. I'm one of the first people to try the new 4.0, and I'm blown away by the performance, the craftsmanship, and details on the 4.0 is next level and when you're a fighter you gotta have some balls whether you train mma boxing or jiu-jitsu you will experience times where you just need to grab your balls and power through your balls will always be there for you but who's there for your balls for me it's Manscaped. They allow me to take care of my balls and make sure that they are in their best shape at all time because I never know when I might need them. With the help of Manscaped, I can now be confident that my balls look good, smell good, and are always ready to help me attain peak performance in combat sport. Manscaped engineered the ultimate groin and body trimmer by focusing on intelligent functionality and an incredibly comfortable grooming experience. Their fourth generation trimmer features a cutting edge ceramic blade to reduce grooming accidents thanks to their advanced skin safe technology. I now feel confident shaving my boys. This upgraded trimmer also includes a multi-function on and off switch that can engage a travel lock. It also gives you the ability to turn the 4000K LED spotlight on and off when needed for a more precise shave. The lawnmower 4.0 even allows you to customize your trim to additional guard lengths with sizes one through four. Then I even mentioned the wireless charging. This new wireless charging system uses electromagnetic induction which can help battery last longer man if you've been using the same nut trimmer on your face for years you've been doing it wrong nobody wants to end up with pubes in their mouths that's why it's time for you to get your own ball air and body trimmer with manscape to make me time the best time and enhance your confidence with some nice smooth boys get 20 percent off and free shipping with the code mma talk at manscape.com that's 20 percent off with free shipping at manscape.com and use the code mma talk Unlock your confidence and always use the right tools for the job with Manscaped. Your balls will thank you. Okay, balls. Thank you, Manscaped. You're the man. Uh, we love you guys. Let's talk about BTC. Oh, yeah, baby. Great night, too. In St. Catharines, Ontario. Very far away from home. But we were there and we were happy. And I'm glad to have you here, Max. Uh, I'll tell you, this is probably your main use for the podcast because <laughs> like, you saw me at that event or you didn't see me at that event because I was just everywhere trying to speak to the most possible people for the vlog. And basically, 
I've looked at the fights here and there, but there's many fights that I basically don't have a fucking clue of what happened. So that's why I have you here because you were there with me and I know you watched the fights. But first one of the night is one that I watched because I was really uh, interested in Binaibi Otohu, a guy from a House of Champion, Kruelin, uh, with uh, the, the, we've seen many fighters from there uh, over the years, many UFC level fighters still in this gym. So uh, I was really interested because Otohu had lost his two, his only two fights, but it was to really high competition. He lost to uh, the only Louis Jourdain in TKO in his first fight. So only lost to to, to really good fighter Nate Ledger too. It was 0-2, but lost to good fighters. And I feel like it was really a tale of, like, a little bit like Morgan Ammo, the the, the the technical striker, trying to keep his range and be calm and collected and land the better strikes. Again, the guy that was trying to make it dirty, to make it an ugly fight where they were close range and hitting each other. And basically, it didn't work until, like, the final, final second of the fight when Nate Ledger almost knocked Benabi Otoru out. Like, honestly, there was 10 more seconds and maybe Nate Ledger had just won that fight. But there wasn't 10 more seconds and Otoru had clearly won, <laughs> let's say, almost all of the fight. But it's, not, it's tough not to give that third round to Ledger because of the damage he did at the end. So won almost all the fight up until then and that means he, he got away with the decision here yeah there was a bit of a diaz edwards feeling when ledger really like shook otoru with a good right if i remember and then otoru went in the cage and wasn't wasn't completely there but ledger maybe took this approach a little bit late in the fight a great showing from uh, otoru the nigerian nightmare um who showed up uh, to fight showed up with a good iq he knew what he had to do to win, and he did it. So, yeah, it was a good fight to start the night for sure. Yes, and then we had the chance to see two professional debuts, stuff that we can't do in Quebec. I don't know why, <laughs> but <laughs> two professional debuts. Uh, and one was kind of highly anticipated. It was Cody Chovancek, and uh, he really delivered. Uh, there was, I'd say, some moments here and there where Martin Yuk was able to come, to come out with some power and not really err to Chovancek per se, but like make him think about it and make him like react to his shots. But like the story of the fight was really Chovancek striking. He was able to, to really uh, get the edge over his opponent and even to, to finish him before the end of the fight at three minutes, six of the third round. So real impressive stuff from uh, the, the, the guy from Niagara top team, the first Niagara top team fighter on the card. And it was a win for him. And as you will see, it was pretty much wins all around for Niagara top team. On It was really their night. They won that night by far. And uh, the first guy to, to, to get the ball rolling for them was Cody. Yeah, I'm interested to see Chovancek again for sure. Uh, good on Martinuk. I mean, first pro fight, it's for sure not easy. I uh, got it last, my man, but keep going. And I'm sure we'll see, uh, we'll see you win in the future. Of course, and then we were moving on to the tournament, the Bantamweight tournament where people are fighting for $10,000. It was the quarterfinals. And like, honestly, that's the thing that interested me the most uh, on that card. That's the, the thing I want to see because every guy, I'd say except one in that bracket, was a prospect, was a guy with few professional fights, but a guy that like we've had our eyes on we and we wanted to see more of them and it, like, I, I really like the way that they put this together because the guy that's going to win this tournament is going to become like one of the best prospects in the country and one of the the well the most well-regarded prospects because you got to be a good prospect, but you also need people to know. And I feel like winning that type of tournament is going to go, be good for helping people get to know you. And one of the first guys that's like a shoe-in for the finals is Albara Atme. Uh, that's one fight I missed. I don't know if you can tell me more, but I know that this basically didn't last that long against Seth Connor. No, sure. One pro fight only for Atme, but it didn't show it. It, it showed that him and his brother fight a lot outside of the cage because he, he looked like a very seasoned fighter. Um, Seth Connor really got like overwhelmed with Atme striking. His wrestling is very good too. Put his opponent on the ground and uh, controlled him right away with a vicious ground and pound. Um, I don't know if I've seen uh, more heavy ground and pound than that in live show. It was very amazing. Uh, the Atme brother are something to look out for sure. And no, the ground and pound was just too much 
for for Seth Connor. If I remember well, this is the fight that I almost thought like the guy was out with the elbows. He wasn't. The fight was stopped uh, on time. But yeah, vicious uh, ground and bound from Atme. Yeah, these brothers, we're going to talk about Izu in, in a little bit, but these fucking brothers, man, oof, they're crazy. Then a guy that is pretty much, I'd say, because the Adma brothers, they're, they're from Calgary. They're like they're out of town guys. So if you're, you're, you're taking the pulse in Ontario and you're talking to people and they're asking, hey, who's winning that tournament? Uh, the guy that people are talking about is Vinny Diaz. That, that's the man. He's an amazing grappler. And he showed it against Sosa. It was put into some spots here and there where Sosa was able to, to sweep or reverse the position and have some good moments on the ground. But ultimately, uh, Vinny was the better grappler and he was able to get a submission win early in the second round to advance in the tournament and really like show us that he can go through some hardships in the fight and still be dominant, maintain his, fav his fav favorite status and... Uh, Like a re really good showing for Vinny here. Oh, yeah, man. That, and you saw in the crowd that this guy is the local legend. Uh, the crowd went wild when he, when he went in. So I'm sure he, he's a good guy to, to look on for the, the rest of the tournament for sure. Yep. And then a guy that's never the favorite. Even in that fight, he wasn't. And he wasn't winning either. But Ariel Zuniga, if you need to know one thing about that guy is that he's one of the craziest motherfuckers out there. And like I asked him, man, you're a fucking madman. Why do you always end up in these type of fights, man? Because every time, every time, the only time it wasn't like an all-out crazy war, it was still a good back-and-forth fight. But he fought Tiche Gautreau, which we're going to talk about. And you know Tiche is a super fucking dominant top-level prospect. So it was a, a tougher fight, let's say, like that for Ariel. But his Gillespie fight was the fight of the year in 2018, if I remember. And then once again against Arlie King, it was able to, to survive some real bad positions, some real submission attempts. And early in the third round, he caught him in a standing guillotine and torqued it like to death, basically, and was able to secure the tap. And like an amazing comeback victory. And then uh, once again, an amazing fight. And like he said, people keep trying to kill me and I, I just don't want to die. And he's not dying, Ariel Zuniga. And he's the guy in the tournament that like you've got some favorites. You've got the, 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 the little phenoms, the brothers, they're amazing. But you've got here the real live underdog that It's not going to be favored against any of these guys. Let me tell you, we're, we're not going to favor him against the brothers. We're not going to favor him against Vinny Diaz. But he's the guy that could come out of nowhere in the third round and knock your ass out or submit you out of nowhere and just fucking win it because he's never really supposed to win and he still does almost every time. Oh, yeah. This was definitely one of one of my favorite fights on the card. Uh, crazy guy, Zuniga. He comes to fight. He comes to give a show. Uh, submission threat and on the feet oh my god he can punch uh, his opponent and good on Arlie King I mean like I said this was one of my favorite fight to watch from this night we were very tired because of everything that just happened in Montreal in the road and this really woke my ass up it was one hell of a fight a uh, great finish uh, good uh, good respect from both guys after the fight what a war man I can't wait to see Zuniga again he really got my heart for sure Oh, Zuniga's my guy, man. And then uh, Izudin Atme, the other brother uh, against Nate Small. And the other brother, it was 1-1 at loss. And like, you know, Jake Govro, the, 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 the guy from uh, from uh, New Era on the, Ottawa, another guy that never fought as an amateur, like Matteo Vogel. I don't know why Jeff keeps doing that, but he finds those fucking, like, guys that are 19 years old that have never had a fight in their life and he's like okay let's just fight pro just skip the amateurs and these fucking guys just come out and beat Izudin Atme They're like so the, the fact that the brothers are having such success just really goes to show how, how crazy good it is Jake Govro even though the fucking guy is so young it's, it's incredible but Izu, uh, after losing his debut, now two uh, amazing performances in a row, a knockout uh, over Isaiah Meditok, and now a <laughs> less than two minutes in submission of Nate Small. Uh, man, like, what are we going to say? We, I, I try to, to even compare them and say, oh, Albaro is more impressive than... In, not at all. These two guys, these two brothers, they, they're just fucking problems, man. They are, <laughs> man. 
And Nate Small, Nate Small is not an easy opponent. We've seen him at BTC, BTC 12, won his fight, a grueling fight like a war. And then he got choked out by Atme in less than two minutes. That shows how Atme is good. He saw the, the finish was there and he took it. Uh, just like his brother, they're, they're too much for their opponent. They're, um, they give like a lot of strikes in a few uh, moments. And like, I mean, he controlled Small, put him on the ground, heavy pressure, choked him out. I mean, what can we say more from the Atme brothers? Unless that we can't wait to see him to see them again. Yeah. Are they gonna like what's your predictions now? Because it's pretty clear that Isadine is fighting either Zoom Ariel, yes. either Ariel or uh the, the our homie uh, Vinny. Yeah, and Alvaro's fighting the other guys. Like, do you think that there's a chance that we see those brothers fighting in the finals? And do you think that they're gonna fight each other? Uh, yeah, for sure. I believe it. I think it's going to be a warrior scenario. And uh, these two sign the dots on the contracted line because they knew they might fight each other. And I'm sure they're willing to. I'm sure they love each other, but they're fighters. And yeah, I believe that we're going to see them fight in the final. Damn. <laughs> I, have you ever seen a brother versus brother fight? I've never seen that in my no, life. No, but I'm I'm waiting to see one. And this might be the first one ever. That's some rough and rowdy type shit, but like with good <laughs> fighters, like not as not some stupid sideshow. Like you are two fat twins, we're gonna fight each other <laughs> for bar stool. Let's fight. I don't two. wish they fight. I wish one of them win the final for sure. But hey, we don't know what's what's coming. I think I put the uh, Ariel uh, versus Izudin, and I put Vini against Albara, and we see what's going to happen. Rob told me which one are gonna, is going to be fighting which one, but I don't even remember. It would, so many things <laughs> happened uh, since then. But uh, then we had Tisha Gautro, uh, yeah. a comeback fight for him after like guy went to the LFA on short notice, fought a five and one guy while he was like two and zero or three and zero, and like basically lost a split decision in a fight that yes, I think he lost clearly. But like you can't be mad at yourself with that such less experience than the other guy. Just come in and almost beat him. It was an amazing performance. Uh, he was back in his hometown here for this fight. And like I want to have no knock on him, but it, it wasn't like the best fight of the, the night by far. But the thing is, is that I think he had two to three opponent switches. He had to fight at 145, even though he's a 35er and not the biggest 35er either. I think that at the UFC level, I don't wish that on him, but I think he could cut to 125 possibly if need be. But I uh, had to fight a 45er, an undefeated guy. So, of course, he had to take the... The, 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 the most the more patient way the more prudent yeah. way like he didn't want to go out there and just get his ass beat in front of his hometown because he wanted to go crazy on on a guy that was good and that was coming into fight and that was you know the short notice aspect and there were so many changes so many hurdles that i don't want to blame Tiche for and it was a good performance it was just not the it was a workman like performance he, he didn't come here to to do some crazy stuff and do a, an enormous show for the fans he came in to to get back Back in the win column, get his paycheck, win in front of his people, and that's exactly what he did. And we can't blame him for that. But like, it's sure that when you compare this to all the action that we had in the tournaments bouts and the, and the Cody bout, and it, it, it wasn't not, not one of the best fight of the evening for sure. But still, uh, an amazing performance for Tiche, who's one of the better prospects in Canada, and that I I can't wait to see on the full camp with not an opponent change with like a more normal circumstance let's say like that yeah the guy looks very complete he can fight everywhere he has good ground techniques as well as good striking techniques so yeah Tisha Gudru is for sure someone to look out in the future Yep, and the only th the other thing is that he's a striker, Tisha. like at art this guy's a striker and you we've really seen in, in his last fight trying to, to wrestle a little more. So I know he's still a prospect. He's so young in his career. So he's really trying to round out his game, make sure that he can do everything. And that when it, it's a fight that he believes that he could win easier on the ground, he just goes there and wins it easily on the ground. So yeah. it's cool to see these prospects trying to, to fight outside of their games early in their career. So it just shows out the goes out to prove that this guy is just so well-rounded and he understands the game like people don't really understand the game at that level of, of let's yeah, say. Like he's like got three or four fights, man. 
He's, yeah, he's very... and Bouchard is it wasn't anybody to look down to. He was 2-0, still undefeated, very good prospect. So good on Goudreau to take the fight like with a, a little bit of a slow approach. A good, good fight from both guys. Yep, and then another ground heavy affair, but uh, uh, one that I liked. Because Gabe Sagman was really on top, trying to secure the positions, and and so he was the he was the grappler there. He was the black belt. He was the guy that was gonna bring the fight to the ground and dominate there. And Matt Dawson, you know, that's the knock on his game. That's what happened in his last fight in the uh, in in uh, it was BFL so Vancouver. Uh, he he got taken down and controlled on the ground, but like. He shouldn't accept the positions. Like I, I shouldn't say, "Oh yeah, I fuck with that style," because he's accepting positions and he's losing fights because of that. But fuck, man, I can tell you that I'm not liking a guy on his back just elbowing the shit out of his opponent. And like Gabe really clearly won that fight. There's no doubt. Sagman is the winner here. But fuck, man, when you were looking at these two guys after it looked like Sagman got the shit beat out of him, he was super swelled that day, and I almost shut. So, like. Matt Dawson, man, fuck, he, you shouldn't accept positions like that, but I'm not the guy that's going to tell you that I don't like it. I just really like his style from the guy that's able to, because to, like we've seen that, I don't want to bring back this, the Powell Dario fight, but like we've seen fights where like Dario is the wrong winner in that fight, but he was the winner because he landed some punches from under, but it was no damage. It was like arm punches and like super, just tough to do stuff. Dawson did some damage in that fight. Yeah. That Dawson won a round from his back in on the in that fight. So that's some good work. If only he could accept these positions a little less and be able to get up and strike a little more. And when he's on the ground for some periods, go crazy with your elbows and stuff. Do it, but just don't spend 15 minutes there because it, it, it's still the, the the mentality is still evolving and it's changing a little bit but you're still not usually going to win a fight that you spend that much time under no this guy is definitely vicious on his feet and on his back uh, he just likes to fight you know even after the fight he knew he had lost he was very happy and it just showed to me how good gabe segment and we knew he was good at wrestling and like pressuring his opponent but like he was getting pieced up by Dawson on the feet and he didn't wait too long before he wrestled uh, Dawson, put him on the ground, won the fight clearly with his pressure, with his control. Uh, and Sagman was really messed up after the fight. Uh, he, he got cut up very bad and he told us that Dawson clipped him in the very first minutes of the fight. So it just showed to me the art of the Samurai segment and like his control, his fight IQ. The guy is very good. Climbed up to 6-4, which is a very good uh, fish. It's, it's a good record. Uh, Dawson, I, I honestly can't wait to see Dawson fight again. I like his style. I hope he's going to work a little bit on his, on his like jujitsu and everything. But striking-wise, Dawson is amazing. And good on Gabe segment for a great win, tough win. And uh, yeah, can't wait to see those two guys again. Yeah, for sure. Sagman, he's at the, the, the elite level now uh, in the country. and pr Probably both the Bantamweights and Flyweight division. He's more of a flyweight. I know the cut is... It's disgusting, Brutal. man. He's like, fuck. No, no man should wear. No, no adult man should weigh one twenty-five and yeah. be LT. That's just completely insane. But he's able to do it, and that's probably the division where he could go on and and grab a belt in Canada and really establish his name as like one of the the, the next guys, the next Malcolm Gordon, the next you know, the next flyweight out of Canada to move up to the the next level. And yeah, like you said, there there, there are many guys like that even though they got good jujitsu because yeah sagman's a good wrestler but he's, he's basically a jujitsu guy that's his stuff but there's a lot of people that like the the top control pressure type of style and that even though they're really good jujitsu players sometimes they just get comfortable there and they get caught they get submitted they get even though like james mancini that's that's pretty much his mo the guy uh, before he, he went on his his role in tko he had a losing record because he, he basically was winning all his fights until he got submitted from the bottom. And Gabe Sagman is really in everything he does. And that just shows that he's a good black belt, really intelligent grappler that knows his way around uh, the mats. But like at no point, even though he had a dangerous opponent, uh, he was on top of every dangerous opponent, at no point we, we saw a Sagman like 
be in any kind of trouble, be in surprised by anything Dawson was doing. Yeah, the punchers were landing, were doing damage, but Sagman was eating that damage and still trying to advance, try, still trying to get the better position. So maybe some people would say that that wasn't the best fight on the card, but I'd beg to differ, man. It, it wasn't the best for sure. That was Zuniga King by far, but it's a fight that I really enjoyed. I love me some grappling. Sagman is an amazing grappler, and I love those crazy fucking guys who just like don't care about positions and throw elbows from bottom. That's some shit I like. So I really, I really enjoyed that contest. That might have sure. might not have been the best fight, but it was the bloodiest fight of the night. Ah, for sure, the bloodiest fight of the night for sure. Then Xavier Nash against Thomas Glott, who was uh, supposed to fight for Samurai. Well, suppose like he, he didn't have a matchup on the card per se, but he was one of the French guys that were targeted to, to, to come to fight Samurai if they were able to find a matchup for him. And they weren't, but they I, we know Daniel and uh, Rob Vivers were in close uh, contact because of the, the proximity of their cards and date. Like if there were some cancellations, they were able to call each other up and, oh, I just got a cancellation. Okay, I, I got that guy that I can't book. I'm going to send it over to you. And I know that Samurai were trying to book Dorian Dukai for a while on the Samurai card. They weren't able because nobody fucking wants to fight Dorian Dukai. This guy's a monster. <laughs> and that's normal. I wouldn't fight Dorian. So uh, I don't blame anybody. The only person I blame is Noah Crosswell. What the fuck were you doing, Noah? But uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, Thomas Glott came, fought uh, Xavier Nash. I think he won the first round with his striking. Yeah. Uh, really surprised Xavier, who's a good striker to a guy that loves to strike, but a, a complete fighter uh, in, the, in, in his art. And he was able to secure the takedowns here and get it. A, a tough, gritty decision against a freshman who was on short notice but who was not letting go, who was really trying to win that fight even though it was kind of overmatched in that one. Yeah, totally. I loved, I loved Glut. Uh, I think he showed up well on the feet and Xavier Nash showed his experience. He has almost twice as much fight as Glut has and it showed. Uh, uh, grinded the, de the decision and good on Xavier Nash put up a win and good on Tomoglu short notice fight co-main event at BTC probably doesn't speak a word of English and he was in the middle of Ontario so they, that was a good fight on the card too uh, decision maybe sometimes they're boring this this wasn't one uh, I was on the floor for this one and I think it was Dorian Dakic who, yeah. who is a, a teammate of Xavier Nash and he was really into the fight he was shouting at him for like a, for tips and everything and Nash you could see Nash listening to him So like he's very he's a very good fighter Xavier of course and he's now 5-4 and I think we're going to see him with a good test in his next fight and Tomaglu I hope we're going to see him in, at Samurai for sure. Yep, uh, really good thing and he he really completed the the, the night for Niagara top team with uh, Cody one, Vinny one, Tiche one, Xavier Nash one. So that's a 4 and 0 night which led to the night after where Anthony Romero also won at Fury FC to make it a 5-0 perfect weekend for. Basically, you know, I'm keeping score of all these contests, of all the, the, the Canadian fighters fighting all over the world, and I'm keeping, like, records for the gym. And with this win of Anthony Romero, uh, they basically surpassed TriStar with the better record as a Canadian gym in 2021. So they got the same number of fights and they got a better record than the TriStar fighters. So if anybody was saying that Niagara top team wasn't like one of the premium gyms in the country, uh, I guess we just saw it that night because yeah, we saw people from that gym fighting, but we didn't see no Zachary Powell. We didn't see no Jasmine. We didn't see no Aaron Jeffrey. So not even like the top dogs of that gym were fighting and they beat the shit out of their competition and really showed <laughs> that like you can't fuck with, uh, with Niagara top team right now. They're, they're, they're on a roll then it's well deserved uh, for Chris Prickett, Matt, Matt DiMarcantonio. They're doing such amazing work and it's showing and it's paying out. And yeah, I won't, I won't uh, hide it from you. I love that gym. They're my people, Zachary Powell, Kevin Bastien. They're my homies and wherever my homies go, uh, these people are my homies too. So shout out to my homies from Niagara Top Team yeah. uh, for this great, uh, this amazing night, this amazing weekend for them. 
And then the main event, like, uh, what what were we going to say about that? Sarah Kaufman, pioneer legend. She was fighting Jesse Miele, another top 15 uh, fighter in that division, but a top 15 fighter who was on a two-fight losing streak and who basically uh, didn't have shit for Sarah Kaufman. She won first round, ground and pound TKO, like, as simple as it can get. She was able to take the fight down and beat the shit out of her opponent in under four <laughs> minutes. Uh, it's just cool to see her, man. She should be in the UFC. She's a like like Cal Probolic. She's a fighter that we shouldn't get to see fighting locally, and we had the chance to. So we're just really thankful about that. Yeah, she called out to Amanda Nunez after her win. So I don't know if we're gonna see that, but Kaufman is still very much motivated to fight, and we can't not like it. Yeah, for sure. And you know, one of the one of the fighters that I'll never get why she's not in the UFC. She basically had a one and two record with a no contest and in four fights. That's not a bad record. I don't know what happened there for her not to resign, but mm-hmm. that's bullshit and we need her in the UFC right now. Yeah. So before we conclude, we spoke a little bit about Anthony Romero. Uh, really good performance for him. One, two out of the three rounds uh, at Fury FC. Such an intelligent fighter. That he's not named the genius for nothing. Such a like a cerebral fighter. You can really see that. Yeah, GSP is his idol because he really modeled his game around the great Josh Sapiai. Good jab, good takedowns. At all times, just really composed and aware. He's got so much awareness. He always knows, like, in, in what type of position he is and w- what that entails, basically. Like, okay, I'm here, so what could happen to me? That could happen, that could happen. And, like, he's working for these things not to happen. And that's another guy that should be in the UFC. The guy beat some guys that are in the UFC right now. He's only lost a split decision to JJ Okanovich, like, recently. And... I feel like he should already be in the UFC, so that, that fight shouldn't shouldn't have happened at all. But now he's back on his winning ways, and uh, I'll keep pumping his drums, man. This fucking guy needs to be in the UFC. Do something about it, man. Yeah, good job, Tony, man. And did you... I know we didn't get to watch the UFC, but did you have the chance to see the loopy fight a little bit? No, unfortunately, I'm not going to lie, I did not. Okay, so I, what I happened? know she won, she won a good fight, but that's pretty much it. Yeah, so basically what happened is that she was the most physical fighter in that fight. She was doing some good things with her boxing, but once again, as we've seen in the, the, the recent loopy fights, it was really the clinch control against the cage and some takedowns here and there that were really... Loma Lubunmi, I love her. She's a good fighter. She's a, such a good Muay Thai practitioner, but fuck, she's the smallest 115 by far. Like... You look at all the 115 girls that could do 105, that could make the 105 division in the UFC, and she would probably be one of the smallest amongst them. So it's sure that when you fight a... Lupi's not that big too, like in, in terms of uh, of height, but she's a thick girl. She's a, yeah. a muscly girl. She's an explosive and strong fighter, and it's just a really tough matchup for Loma to, to be able to get out of these bad positions when you've got the really physical fighter clinching you up against the cage and making it rough for you and landing strikes from there. So um, Loopy beating the record, the previous record for the, the three fastest fight, I think it was 70 something days. And it was, of course it was Angela Hill and she just uh, smashed the record uh, by 30 days almost as she fought three times in 42 days now. So she, first year in the UFC and she's already rack- already racking up records. So, Shout out to Loopy. That's my girl. I love yeah. her. I love her style. And Seven and two, man. That's a good record for Loopy. Yep, and her, her only loss uh, her, this year came to the end of a of a one twenty five fighter. She moved up a division to fight like a, a super tall, rangy striker. That was an uh, like a disgusting style matchup for her. But yeah, just she goes lost, out to sh- she lost a split to Jessica Penny at the beginning of the year too. Yeah, but that was bullshit. She won. <laughs> all right yeah no, she was she won the penne fight she absolutely won the penne fight but then w- was able to bounce back the, the carolina loss was really her, her, her only legit loss in my eyes okay and even though like you said it was like a very short notice fight not good matchup right, so she didn't train for that fight so she's eight and oh loopy's eight and oh Oh yeah, undefeated fighter Lupi Godine. So <laughs> that's it for the podcast. Thanks a lot to Maxim Karabin for taking the time to recap these amazing events with me. And like major props to Samurai. 
best night of my life. I had the chance to be on commentary. That was a dream come true. So like, I'm not even kidding. Like it, it was the best night of my life. It was a thing that I always wanted to do. And I had the chance to do it and not only to do it, but to do it with an absolute legend like uh, John Ramdeen. Uh, it was such an honor for me. And then uh, the night after BTC, uh, the driving was tough, man. But we got there and we really enjoyed the, the, this great fight night. So you got to give a shout out to Mustafa, man. Oh, my man. You didn't, my you man. didn't mention Mustafa once, man. Ah, okay. Let's talk about the Mo show. How many times, <laughs> you, want me, how many times you want me to spend on Mo? <laughs> this guy, is, this guy is amazing. I could talk to you about him all day. At first, I'm really stylish guy in the place. Oh yeah, it's tough to be a cowboy, like he said. <laughs> uh, it's tough to be a cowboy. It's tough to be the Mo Show, man. He, he, they're hating on this guy. I don't know why, man. They, he, they're, they're against him. They don't want him to win, but my man's gonna win. You know it. He's got yeah. Cruel in in his corner. He's got Gabe Sagman and his as his jujitsu teacher. He's rocking the cowboy hats. He's rocking their their coats, their leather jackets. He's he's, he's rocking his smile, man. He's smiling yeah. all the time. This guy. Oh, yeah, and he's having a blast, and he doesn't give a shit about what people <laughs> have to say man. about him, man. <laughs> like, they could be hating all they want. He doesn't have a shit to give about it. And, mm -hmm. man, I, I've said it so many times. This guy is a character. Like, he, he, he's not only a really talented fighter, but he's a guy with a personality that many people could rally around and say, oh, shit, I, I, I relate to that guy. I, I love that guy. He, he, he's such a presence when he's there. So, like, you know, it's important in MMA to be a good MMA fighter. And he's got all of that shit covered, like I said, with Cruelin, with all the one of the best gyms in the country who produced the Shane Campbells, the Michael Malott, the Kyle Nelsons, now the Diana Belbitas there too. Uh, they're just amazing. I'm just naming a few there. And um, so he's got that part covered for sure. And he's got the personality. He's got the, 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 the appeal, the, the little something that... When you see this guy, you want to talk to him. You want to know more about him. So amazing, amazing guy. Yeah. Real glad to, to, to have the chance to meet him finally in person and to, to, to go briefly to, to the after party to give a beer to, uh, to, our, main, to our main man, Gabe, and uh, just go out there and, and, and see them and congratulate everybody from the team. And, you know, man, I told him December, 9, December 18 uh, at the Tarpsoff event, if they want us to party with them, we're going to do it. We're going to take a room and we're going to stay and fucking hang out with our friends. And well, gonna... yeah, we're going to show him how we do it from uh, from our beautiful Belle Province. Thanks to BTC, man. That was that was nice. Next time, I'm, I'm, I promise I'm going to get more sleep, so I'm going to be more into it. But it was very nice. Thank you for the event. Thanks to Samurai, man. Thanks to Faber for inviting me on, on your show. Uh, it's a pleasure, my man, and it was a pleasure to have you uh, with me to, to, to live that, the Samurai events. You did an amazing job with the vlog. I can't wait for... Uh, no, in fact, go check out the vlog because uh, I'm delaying the podcast this week. It's Thursday, Tuesday is the vlog, and Wednesday is the podcast. Uh, the vlog needs to get out. It's so amazing. It needs to get out. So it's already out now. So fuck, go check at it. You go look at it if you haven't yet. And that's it. That's all I got to yeah. say, man. Thank you, Max. Thanks to yes. everybody. And next week, uh, we're trying to speak to people again. That was a, a one-off because we lived like two amazing events. So we needed to take a, a full hour to speak about those events and about the amazing things that the fighters did and that the promoters did. So that's what we did. But next week, we're back to interviews with the, your favorite Canadian fighters. So thanks to Max. Thanks to you for watching. And see you next time.